Well, welcome once again. Glad that you were all here this morning. Uh, keep Pastor Eric in your prayers. He's, uh, he's feeling ill this morning, so keep him in your prayers. Turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. We have been preaching through the Gospel of Luke for several months now. We're getting close to the end. Picking up in chapter 19 and verse 28. Let's pray, then we'll read through the text this morning, and then we'll give the message. Father, as we come before you this morning, your word, knowing that it is living and active, we ask that your word would do its work in our hearts that you send it to do. We know that your word never returns void. We know that your word searches us, the intentions of our heart. We know that your word conforms us and sanctifies us. And so we ask that your word would have its work in us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's go ahead and read through our text this morning. Luke chapter 19, we're picking up in verse 28. Now, Jesus, in this context, Jesus is making his way now to Jerusalem. This long-awaited trip, as we've walked through the Gospel of Luke, um, his disciples were looking forward to this time when Jesus would enter into Jerusalem, and they had great expectations for this day. This was going to be the day that all that they had desired, all that they had wanted and hoped for was going to come to pass. Jesus was going to be set on the throne in Jerusalem and begin to rule over his new kingdom. So they thought. We pick up in verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethage and Bethany at the, moment, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around and surround you and hem you on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. In verse 45, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do for the people were hanging on his words. Well, this morning I want to pause and give us a little perspective on our lives. You see, we all need to occasionally do that, don't we? Stop the hurry and the busyness and the routine of our lives and just think. This morning I'm going to ask you to think about your purpose. What am I here for? What is my purpose? 
You see, church, we live in confusing times, don't we? We live in times where the things that we once trusted, we no longer trust. The things that we once depended upon, we don't believe we can depend upon anymore. And so it's an important time for us as God's people to remember and to reflect upon our purpose. Why are we here? So take out a pen, some paper, and maybe take some notes that you can look at later during your time of reflection. And I want you to do some deep thinking, some introspection, some self-examination, asking yourself about your purpose in your own worship of God. I want you to ask yourself, am I satisfied with the depth of devotion and worship that I am offering God? Is my relationship with my creator deep and growing and personal, or has it become shallow and distant? William Temple, who's an old Anglican pastor from the 1800s, said this, To worship God is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to fill the imagination with the beauty of God, to open the heart with the love of God, and to devote the will to the purposes of God. Simply put, worship is our response to the self-revelation of God. That's what worship is. The word itself, worship, comes from this old English term, worth Skype, or worth ship. And it means to attribute value or worth to something, to highly cherish it, to highly esteem it. Worship is the reason all things were created. God didn't just create all of this magnificence around us just because he was bored one day. He created it so that his glory and so that his ultimate power and supreme perfections would be displayed to all of his creation. Worship is how you respond or how much worth you attribute to the revelation of God in your life. You know, worship was never meant to be one hour of professionally designed and presented and planned hour of the week. Unfortunately, many churches, that's what it is. It is simply one hour of week that is professionally packaged and designed and presented for your entertainment. That is not what worship is. It was never meant to be that. Worship is a way of life. It is a personally, daily, lived out gratitude, praise, thanksgiving, honor, love, and obedience to the God who created us. And God is searching for it. It is rare. God is seeking it out. Turn with me quickly to John chapter 4. Just a few pages over to the right. John chapter 4 and verse 23. But the hour is coming and is now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. But God isn't just seeking any kind of worship. Let's go to that first slide. You see, millions of people worship every day. God doesn't accept all forms of worship. You might write that down. God does not accept all forms of worship. Yet he created us to be worshipers. There are only three forms of worship that we find in the scriptures. That is false worship, 
vain worship and true worship. Ask yourself, what kind of worshiper am I? You know, to worship God rightly, you must rightly know God. To worship God rightly, you must rightly know God. And how do we do that? We do that by reading his word. The self-revelation of God. You see, God initiated a relationship with you and I by telling you about himself through his written word. The basis of true worship is the covenant relationship God has to those he has called to himself. You see, he has called you and he has saved you so that he can sanctify for himself a group of people who are true worshipers. In his book, John Piper uh, writes in, in one of his books that missions exist because there are places in the world where true worshipers don't. Now, everywhere in the world there are worshipers. As you can see on the screen, there are people who worship trees and stones, false gods, idols and statues. Worship exists everywhere, but there are places in the world where true worship does not exist. And that's why God has called us on mission. Let's turn back to our text here. Jesus is now entering Jerusalem. His disciples are so excited. They think this is it. This is the time they've been waiting for. They shouted praises. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They are ready to put Jesus on the throne. They are ready to, to kick out the Romans and be ruled over by Jesus himself. And so as Jesus enters in to the city of Jerusalem, we have to ask ourselves this question. Jesus is entering in. They're shouting praise and hosanna. God saves. They're shouting these things, but is their heart in the right place? What I want to do is I want to compare their response to the response that we find in, from King David in, in Psalm 96. So hold your finger there in Luke. <clears throat> Let's turn back to Psalm 96. Psalm 96, let me just read this to you and then we'll look at it. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works from all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. The first thing that we notice here is that David's delight is in God himself. His delight is not in what God can do for him. His delight is in God, in the attributes of God, the person of God. And he expresses himself by seeing, seeing all the earth tell of his salvation to all the inhabitants of the nations. You see, a true spiritual worshiper of God will praise God and proclaim his attributes and his excellencies to others. 
You know, we all, when we have something that we enjoy, we want to tell others about it, right? Whether it's a book that we read or a movie that we see or some experience that we have, we want to tell others about it because that completes our joy, being able to share it with others. You see, true worshipers will have that kind of experience. They enjoy so much God himself, the person of God, that they have to share that with others. Next, David praises God for his greatness. Look there in verses 4 through 6. For God, and he compares God to all the false gods of the people, saying that their false gods are worthless idols. They have no value whatsoever. Ever. And in church, an idol doesn't have to be something that we create with our hands and an overlay with gold. An idol can be something that we create in our minds or in our hearts, something that we devote ourselves to above God himself. David goes on to say that the splendor and majesty and strength and beauty of God are his attributes. He celebrates God for who he is. You know, oftentimes we reduce God down to something that we want him to be. And unfortunately, his disciples, as Jesus was making him his way into Jerusalem, knowing that the cross was before him, yet his disciples were excited because Jesus was finally going to give them what they wanted. The people celebrated his entrance into, into Jerusalem because they thought that they were going to be free of the oppression of the Romans and that they were finally going to have a place in his kingdom, a place of authority, a place of power. We find here in, in David's Psalm of 96 that he encourages us to worship God. Look at verses 7 through 9. That we should worship God for the families of God should proclaim his greatness and worship him together as families, that we are to ascribe to God the glory and strength due his name, that apart from worship, there is nothing that we can do to honor him. <clears throat> his praise and his honor is what should be on our lips, that he is more valuable and valued to us than any of our possessions. Church, we need to ask ourselves, what am I giving as a sacrificial offering to God to express my worship of him? Am I tipping God or am I giving to him sacrificially? God is the supreme just judge. David goes on to say that he's going to drop the hammer of justice on all unrighteousness and on all ungodliness and that all sin will be punished. Church, there is no righteousness outside of the person of Christ. Those who are without Christ are without righteousness in his sight. God sent his son Jesus to rescue us from the wrath of God, the punishment that God will pour out on all sin. <clears throat> now we see here, and we see all throughout Scripture, that there is a pattern for worship. And we see this pattern played out time and time again. God sets out a pattern for worship that is consistent through the scriptures. <clears throat> there is a pattern of false worship. Let's go to that next slide. <clears throat> false worship means the wrong God with the wrong heart in the wrong way. That is idolatry. And we see this time and time again through the scripture. Man creates a God to satisfy himself. <clears throat> the first three commandments forbid such worship. Deuteronomy 8, 19. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that, you're, that you shall surely perish. Isaiah 42, 8 is another warning. I am the Lord, that is my name, my glory I will give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. <clears throat> there is a pattern of false worship <clears throat> in the scriptures. Secondly, there's a pattern of vain worship. Let's go to that next slide. <clears throat> 
Now, vain worship is a little different. Vain worship is worshiping the right God with the wrong heart <clears throat> and in the wrong way. That is vain worship. Man attempts to come to God on his own terms, to worship God as he pleases. <clears throat> in Isaiah, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5, we see Cain and his offering that God has no regard for. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So Cain brought God an offering. God had no regard for his offering and Cain got angry. Israel's constant turning to false teachers, we see again and again. We see in the, New, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, who lied about their offering to God. And the Pharisees, who in their pride, thought they could satisfy God by keeping a bunch of man-made rules and traditions. This is vain worship, worshiping the right God in the wrong way. Again, there's a pattern of this in the scriptures. Those who think they can worship God their own way will be rejected by God. He will not accept vain worship. Then there's an also a pattern of true worship. Let's go to that last slide. True worship is worshiping the right God with the right heart in the right way. There is a pattern of this in the scripture. God lays out a pattern of true right worship. In the Old Testament, we see this pattern, the Sabbath day, keeping it set apart and holy for the Lord, unlike the pagans. The annual feasts, this regular recognition of God's provision and his mercy and his loving kindness as people came together and prayed and shared a meal and celebrated God's faithfulness together as God's people. The Day of Atonement, a national day of repentance of sin. <coughs> as the high priest would sacrifice animals to temporarily atone for the sins of the people. You see, all of these were external observances where God was kept preeminent in the hearts of the people. As a, as a reminder to God's people of who he is and what he had done for them. Now, these patterns of worship continued even into the New Testament. You see, in Jesus' day, the temple was still there, but it had been corrupted by vain worship. And so God, and we see here in, the, in our text this morning, that Jesus goes into the temple, and he sees that they had set up tables, and they were selling and buying things. It had become a flea market. They've been worshiping the right God the wrong way. And so Jesus cleansed the temple of their vain worship. He insisted that his father's house would be a house of prayer. Jesus pointed the people to true worship. For example, in John chapter 4, Jesus explains to the Samaritan woman that worship is not about going to a specific place at a specific time. In fact, let's just go ahead and turn there, John chapter 4. Turn back to John chapter 4, verses, verse 19. We pick up, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. But Jesus said to her, and here he is correcting her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And that's when he goes into, well, the hour is coming when he, and it's now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, Jesus corrected her understanding of worship. He gave her a right pattern for worship. Jesus also established the ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Again, as a reminder to always keep in the forefront of our minds who God is and what he requires of us. Worship is not about places or rituals, but it's about keeping God foremost in our hearts. In Acts 2, we read the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Again, this is a daily reminder, a daily pattern of worship for us to follow as the church, as God's people. 
You see, God destroyed the temple for a reason. There is a reason that the temple is no longer in Jerusalem. There is a reason that all of us don't take treks out to the temple in Jerusalem. God destroyed that old way because there is a new and better way. There is a new and better temple. A temple no longer built from blocks of stone, instead built out of living stones. The church of Jesus Christ, the people, the body of Christ, where God's spirit dwells. It is a church, it is a temple that would reflect more the glory of God than any building ever could. See, the people of God who were indwelt by his spirit, showing compassion and love and joy, would overflow in the streets and towns and shine as an example of God's glory to the world. So ask yourself, how can I live that? How can I proclaim the glory of God, and offer him true worship and keep him foremost in my heart and in my mind. You see, church, we can know him more personally and obey him more completely and glorify him more fully by looking for ways to honor him every day in our lives, not just an hour on Sunday morning. There's an example of this kind of worship in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, we find Mary sitting at Jesus' feet, worshiping him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of the rec- those reclined at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment, made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why does this ointment, why is this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said to this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he had, having charge of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put in it. And Jesus said, leave her alone <clears throat> that she may be kept, that, so that she may keep it. For the day of my burial, for the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. See, this is an example of Mary worshiping daily, just out of the daily routine of life, expressing her love and devotion to the Lord. That's true worship. That's the kind of worship the Lord requires of us. Not the rituals and the uniforms and the garb and all of the things that man, the ceremony that man tries to create. We need to ask ourselves, what what are some ways that we can know Jesus better and worship him more fully in my life? So church, we know that there is a pattern of worship to keep the Lord's day, to sing his praises, to humble ourselves in prayer to hear the preaching of his word, to fellowship and share meals together, to observe baptism in the Lord's Supper, to give our offerings to him. This is the pattern of true worship that the Lord requires of us. It's the biblical pattern of worship. But you know, all those things can be done and you still not be worshiping God in a way that's acceptable to him. Because if we're just going through the routine If this just becomes a routine and a pattern of our lives that we just come into church and we do and we sing and we stand up, sit down, pray, bow our heads, but our minds and our hearts are not there. See, we can do all those things mindlessly and with a heart that is not devoted and held captive to Christ. True worship is true worship because God looks at the heart. He wants your heart. He wants your affections. He wants your mind, your thoughts, your devotion, your attention on him. Listen, church, we all get distracted. We all go through times in our lives when our heart feels far from God. But God is always there drawing us back to him. He is always seeking out true worshipers. 
So when the phone rings while you're praying, don't answer it. When the kids are fighting and making a fuss while you're reading the scriptures, just let them fuss. Don't let the distractions of the enemy pull you away from your time with him. God desires true, devoted worship from his people. So don't let the trivial, the less worthy, the distractions take you away from worship. Ask yourself, do I let myself get distracted while I'm praying and reading the scriptures, while I'm in church worshiping? Do I let the noisy kids next to me distract me? Or do I focus my attention on him? Do I let the vibrating phone in my pocket pull me away from the sermon? We have to discipline ourselves. You see, God's people have to be a disciplined people. God is making worshipers. God is saving people. You know, it might surprise you to know that salvation isn't just about you saving you from hell. You see, God is saving people that they might become worshipers of him for his glory. God is making worshipers. God-hating, rebellious sinners transforming them into loving, obedient worshipers of him so that his name might be exalted in the world. First Peter says that we are a people for his own possession, that we might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Am I proclaiming the goodness of God and looking for opportunities to praise him in the world each day? At the grocery store? Worship begins with us personally in our private prayers and our acts of service and extends to our family worship time as our families gather around the table each week. It extends further to our time here together once a week as we worship corporately. So we have personal worship, we have family worship, we have corporate worship each week as we join our hearts together and sing and worship God. But as Christians, we must put worship as a priority in our lives. We can't let ourselves fall into false worship where we let other things take preeminence in our lives over God, idolatry. We have to guard ourselves against vain worship because all of us have participated in vain worship where we kind of go through the motions and we worship the right God, but we do it the wrong way. We want to do it our way. We have to be devoted to true worship, worship that God is, accepts and is pleased with. Is the worship of God a priority in your life? We look back at our text back in Luke, and we see the celebration of the disciples as Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> we see their praise, but we very quickly find that they fall away, don't we? as we move now that he has entered into Jerusalem, as we move through the next few chapters, <clears throat> we'll find that many of those who were sounding, Hosanna, praise, the, you know, praise him who comes in the name of the Lord, we'll find that they desert him, that they abandon him. They betray him. They didn't get what they were expecting. Let's pray. Father, I pray that our expectations of you are aligned with your word. That our worship of you is aligned with your word. Father, I pray that though there are times in our lives where we might be disappointed because we didn't get what we wanted. That we wouldn't turn that 
into vain worship or false worship, <clears throat> but that we would humble ourselves, that we would seek out Christ, that we would take time daily to pray, to read your word, to worship you as a lifestyle, not as something that we just do on Sunday morning, and that we as a church would be committed to your word as the primary focus of our worship time together, that you have revealed yourself to us through your word and that we would regard your word highly, that we would esteem it, and that we would worship you and glorify you all the more because we've learned who you are through your word. We pray these things now in Jesus' name, amen.